morning. Um, for the those of you who don't know me, I am Cathy. I take care of partnership and membership here at Tixa, with also the help of Jess. She's going to pop her hand up and hi. So Jess um, helps us. Is my coordinator. Some of you would have, I'm sure, spoken to Jess um, over the last 12 months. Just a quick little bit of housekeeping before we kick off today's session. We like to keep this as interactive um, and so we invite you all just to use the chat function um, to field any questions you might want to ask. Um, appreciate if everybody could keep their voice function muted and I'll endeavour to work through the questions um, as we go through. So, kicking it off. I'm delighted to have Peter Abbott, General Manager of Sealink South Australia, with us this morning. Uh, Peter joined Sealink uh, SA in January this year, right in the thick of the universe, throwing us a curveball. Um, for those of you who don't know Peter, he's no newcomer to our industry by any um, stretch of the imagination, having spent the last 30 years in tourism events and attraction management. Before joining Sealink, he was the CEO of the Bendigo um, Heritage and Attractions in Victoria, where he led multi-site um, operations across Bendigo, um, successfully developing many major projects um, to enhance the visitor experience, as well as winning the Australian Tourism Award. In addition to this, um, Peter has also managed major accommodation properties and visitor experiences, visitor service operations in Warrnambool on the Great Ocean Road, where a few of you may be more familiar to him, more familiar by his name, Mr. Oddball, uh, for successfully developing the conservation and tourism project that ultimately turned into a, a fabulous Australian movie um, called Oddball. Other roles Peter's had in his amazing career includes operations manager with the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre and also with the South Australian Tourism Commission as regional manager for the Limestone Coast. Welcome, Peter. What an intro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay and thanks everyone for joining. And yeah, so as I say, um, it's been a busy six months for me, but of course the whole industry, it's... Uh, been pretty challenging so hopefully yeah. uh, some of the things we'll go through today will show that big companies and small companies are all going through uh, some difficult times but uh, trying to navigate our way out of it yeah absolutely I've got a presentation so maybe I'll throw that up on the screen if that's all right um, that would be perfect Peter and then as you do that, I suppose, instead of me reeling off all the brands and products that come under C-Link, are you able to give us a bit of an understanding to what comes underneath the banner of C-Link? Because we, I know there's a lot more to, to C-Link than the humble KI Ferry, but to enlighten our audience today. Right, so everyone can see that shot of Murray Princess sitting up on the bank? Lovely. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so... We don't normally park it up there, but um, through the uh, COVID times, uh, we suspended the operations of uh, Murray Princess and took the opportunity to take the boat from uh, Manham up to our dry dock facility in Renmark, and uh, that's it's sitting up on the uh, on the dry dry dock, um, having maintenance works done on it. So I think a lot of us have all done similar things where we've had to uh, take on opportunities if we have been suspended to try and do some. Uh, some uh, maintenance on our assets. So I'm just going to try and go through the next screen. So just for those who don't know, um, Sealink was founded in 1989 in Adelaide. Um, a group of the company directors and start, uh, managers bought bought uh, the ferry operations off a Malaysian company and, and formed uh, Sealink. Uh, and obviously we, our main uh, product at that stage was running ferry services between the mainland and Kangaroo Island. Um, so through acquisitions and, and other um, purchases, we're now quite a large company in that we have 8,700 staff uh, around Australia, um, internationally as well, through Singapore and London. Uh, in no November last year, we uh, Sealing bought a company called Transit Systems, which uh, is Australia's largest um, metro bus operator. And they essentially specialised in 
running government contracts for public transport just uh, basically around around uh, Australia, but also in, as I mentioned there, London and Singapore, where we have a fleet of buses that run uh, government contracts over there. So, um, and also we have around 80 vessels around Australia that we operate, whether it be uh, ferry, AI ferry, um, but we also have um, barges and other sort of um, operations at different parts of the state. Now, I'm just gonna wave my hands because I'm in a room that has got timed, um, timed light. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So I'm that's why I'm waving my hand. So with, with the acquisition in um, in November, we now have two divisions. One is marine and tourism, which I operate in, and basically uh, we have operations in uh, at every state of Australia apart from Victoria, uh, and then transit systems, which of course uh, continues around the metro bus bus contracts. So we've with transit transit and uh, Sea Link, um, we've just uh, secured the contract to run the. Brisbane ferry uh, services for the city of Brisbane. So um, I guess it's a combination of Sealink's experience in running vessels with transit systems experience in running public transport. So yeah, oh, fabulous. So we run. Uh, I think that contract starts later in the year, but essentially running now um, the Brisbane ferry services. We also just recently won the contracts or transit has to run more bus services in in Adelaide and also the tram network in Adelaide as well. So once again, um, I'm in the marine tourism side of things, so we don't operate, I don't get involved in the public transport, but for Sealing South Australia, we obviously have our um, KI ferry services with all the associated services linked to that. So we run a, a public transport service down from Adelaide to meet the ferry and also on the island, we run a, um, a shuttle service between Kingscote and uh, Pennyshaw. We operate Murray Princess, um, Cruise ship up on Murray, up on the Murrays, you know. KI touring, so we run um, day tours, of course, on the island. KI Odyssey is, a, is our small group um, tour business, which is essentially um, well heavily impacted with the COVID restrictions at the moment. Mm -hmm. And of course, we also have um, adventure tours on the island, which is more our sort of um, a younger younger market for our backpackers and um, doing more adventurous things on the island. Adelaide sightseeing. And Vivon Bay Lodge, which was um, our accommodation facility on the island, which unfortunately we lost. Sorry. We lost yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks for sharing that. So, where's business at currently for these South Australian based products? Where, where's operations at, given obviously some, you know, impacted by the fire, but then also with the pandemic situation, Peter, where's, where's operations at? Yeah, so obviously, uh, even well, through the the travel restrictions in South Australia, we, we tied up one of our ferries through April and May. So uh, um, if you know the ferry, the sea line was the ferry that we tied up um, because the demand had dropped off so much that it uh, was only really viable to run uh, one ferry. Um, we've now returned both ferries to service and uh, obviously coming into, into May, into June, uh, both ferries have been operating. This, this week, we've actually taken one of the other uh, Spocky out of service because it's up in Adelaide at the moment getting dry dock. We have a, a, a scheduled service uh, this time of year. Pretty much one of our ferries always goes into service. Uh, so we're down to one ferry for the next two to three weeks, depending on how long it takes to get the um, Spocky back onto service. Murray Princess is operating um, restricted uh, tours. We, we're on the river at the moment. That's due to come back in on um, uh, Friday and then there'll be a week gap between we go we go out again on the following Friday. All our touring, bus touring was suspended. Uh, we started touring again though this week. So 5th of August, uh, we started our tours back on the island. Very low numbers we're getting, but either way we are, we've got I think maybe six people on tour today down on the island. Um, oh, that's fabulous news. But either way, we're starting to re-engage our staff back into those. And Vivon Bay Lodge, which I'll show you some pictures of in a second, is um, in the rebuilding phase. Yeah. Oh, interesting. It'd be great to see. And yeah, um, fabulous just to see um, steps forward in the right direction and, and slowly get, gather some more positive momentum in terms of business operations resuming as well. Yeah. So with today's session, it's always good to look forward, but it's sort of difficult to look forward without going back. So just you personally, Peter, as a GM, how's the last six months been for you? Um, obviously, what you've had to lead the organisation 
through this time? What's What have you come out with? What's your insights and feelings and learnings, I guess? Um, well, certainly up the whole, well, first of all, when I arrived, bushfires was the main issue we were dealing with, particularly our island staff. And with the loss of Vivon Bay, we had um, 15 to 16 staff that lost their jobs, essentially, or at least were stood down through the fire period. Um, and then, of course, when COVID started um, creeping into South Australia, we had to suspend a whole range of um, staff. So, as I said, we had 330 staff when we started, I think probably um, about 280 of them got either stood down or reduced hours through that period. So, at the moment, we're going through a bit of a re-engagement, trying to get our operations back going. But I think all our staff are affected in some ways with um, with stand downs and uh, um, you know job keeper and trying to navigate their way through the job keeper process. But I guess personally, it's been a difficult. It's how, how, always hard enough to start a new job, but um, also to try and uh, start in a bit of a crisis is. Uh, you know, crisis management certainly been part of the role over the last six months. But essentially, uh, you know, I'd have to say all our staff have been handling themselves extremely well in the sense that they understand this is not a, um, a personal um, uh, you know, decision that we've made of having, having to stand people down. It's obviously business related. And, but certainly I think the human toll is, um, is something that we'll, we'll see over the next... Um, well, we're trying to manage our way through that to make sure all our staff are supported as much as they can all the way through the process. The COVID issue is obviously still, you know, some more with what's happening in Victoria. Um, you know, I think we sort of got to remind ourselves that we it's not over and, and don't fall back into old um, habits. But ultimately, um, yeah, we're, we're trying to maintain our, our, um, our, our focus on maintaining a safe environment for both our staff and our guests important absolutely peter and i'm sure whilst um obviously listening today are small family businesses as as well as large organizations as well and i think that's the common denominator for many people are through this challenge is the staff aspect um you know some are supported by job keeper some are supported by job um, um seeker as well but you know potentially some aren't as well so um it's it's that that staff is that real human element of, of the, and it get that and that that's what gets personal, isn't it, through managing this. Um, but I also think it's about how you know we we treat staff, and I think that loyalty will potentially pay off, um, and flow through later into the future as well, um, by pe by staff feeling more connected to the product and the business. Sure. I might just show the next screen, which is obviously where um, our people on Bay Lodge, uh, that's obviously pre-fires. So, uh, and I guess even internally, um, the fires were very active, of course, in January and, and we had ferry operations affect the touring. But when we lost our lodge, I think it really uh, hit home to all our head office staff and around the whole business. Impacts of that. Um, obviously, the, the fire didn't leave much. So, um, you know, we've certainly been challenged going through our insurance company to make sure we try and maximise our payout and uh, work through what's left. So what, what did stand, what did survive was our bistro. You can see the bistro on the left there with um, salt and pepper shakers waiting for the next customer to come in. But uh, essentially um, the kitchen at the back, which was attached to the bistro, was lost as well. So... Uh, that's what we're in the process of re rebuilding at the moment. So, and as I mentioned before, so we're in the process of starting to rebuild our holiday house we had down there in our bistro will start next week. What was the capacities of, of Vivon Bay? Uh, we had 38 beds and then the, the bistro was there to help service our day tours from a meal point of view. Um, yeah. But yeah, the lot, most of the property was burnt in some way. Yeah. Um, but you know, amazingly, a couple of the buildings did survive. So we've lost all our accommodation on the site. Our kitchen, as I mentioned, most of our out, out buildings, such as laundries and, and other things. Um, the holiday house did survive. It burnt you know, the veranda off the front of the uh, holiday house, but for whatever reason, the actual house did, didn't catch fire. So from a positive point of view, though, we're starting to look at rebuilding that uh, next week. And um, we hope to have the bistro back up and operating shortly 
Oh, fabulous. Well, that's a good, good step in the right right direction. And, and it's all about drawing on these positives during this time as well. I agree with you, Peter. So um, looking forward as, you know, we hear you're operating today, whilst that's obviously in a limited capacity, uh, we're open to the South Australian market and some interstate markets, which I know this is only probably a portion of your market mix prior to not only the bushfires, but pandemic. How are things looking? What are things looking like? How are things sort of shaping up around these markets for you? And, and perhaps how are you going to try and start to take, make some more opportunities um, through these markets? Yeah, I might just take my screen down. Um, yeah, so certainly, look, yeah, particularly some of our products on the island were very heavily international focused. So our product team have done a fair bit of work to try and change some of the natures of our product to uh, our touring product, particularly to try and target more of that domestic market. Yeah. Um, now, whether we're doing it successfully, it's still yet to be seen. I think, you know, all of us were hoping that the borders would open probably that July 20 date when, when Victoria was sort of under control and we were making some plans to start our touring in August based around all the borders starting to open up July 20. That hasn't happened, but ultimately we've, we've designed some new products focusing on the, um, on the domestic market, our, our Road to Recovery tour, which is a new tour that's being operated by um, Odysseys, which is our small group touring, is very much focused on um, bushfire recovery and trying to leverage people's interest in seeing uh, the, the, the fire recovery that's happening on the island. I think, uh, in general, South Australians are travelling, which is really positive. We had quite a positive school holidays, and hopefully most of the operators on the island would have seen a positive um uh, school holiday program. Uh, August is always a little bit of a quieter month anyway, but once again, we've had some reasonably good weather. It's been a little bit rough the last couple of days going across onto the island, but uh, <laughs> in many ways, we've had a reasonably good run in, in weather disruptions. I think South Australians, because it's mainly only South Australians at the moment, they book at very short notice. So they uh, look at the weather and uh, look at... Um, what they've got planned, and particularly looking at the weather, I think if the weather's fine and sunny, then they'll make a booking. So I think our lead times um, have been very lot, lot shorter than what the international market is. So yeah. Murray Princess is basically operating on a restricted um, cruise time, mainly because all we're really servicing is South Australians. But once again, we're seeing a lot of um, South Australians that would normally go overseas uh, looking for cruise options as an, as an example. So. Um, we're seeing people, you know, looking to travel, and uh, in many ways, South Australians, I think, still feel quite confident in travelling within it within our own. I agree. State. I think the South Australians are definitely going to have um, a healthy appetite to travel in our own state and explore our own backyard, um, because as we might be compared to some of our interstate counterparts, uh, there is going to be a lot of more confidence in um, sticking to our state as well. So hopefully we'll see that flow on um, through the intrastate business. But also understand that the interstate um, market does take up a big proportion um, of, of the market mix market and how are you guys sort of trying to keep that conversation going with not only existing customers but potentially new customers as well you dropped out there a little bit but ultimately um yeah look we're obviously still trying to foster interstate travel into south australia there's obviously border restrictions that are really hampering us but uh you know we still get some queenslanders coming in we've had a few people from queensland cruising on murray princess this week so um once again our forward bookings We've had to go through a process of uh, looking who's actually sitting in our forward bookings and then work out whether are they really coming or, you know, and a lot of pe people still want to come. Um, yeah. um, but they, you know, obviously waiting to see uh, where how the borders are going, particularly our Victorian market, New South Wales market. I think one of the big challenges we've got is the late changes that are happening. So in many ways the border's been closed at pretty short notice. That's really denting com people's confidence to say, you know, I'll go to South Australia or I'll go to come out of New South Wales because there, there is a concern that they might be uh, not trapped here. But you know what I mean? They, they may not be able to go back as easily as, as, as what yeah, they would. Yeah, exactly. Those Thanks. goalposts keep on changing, yeah. I, I suppose, is, is the challenge for the consumer, isn't it? 
It is. And that's not, not just on the travel market, but it's also... Is there any sort of... You go. <laughs> no, you go. You're on. No, I was going to just say, is there anything that's sort of particularly speaking in terms of value adds or packaging up with other activities or people sort of just being um, purchasing sort of one sort of one sort of product at a time, essentially? No, we're seeing, um, once again, when we're doing our budgets, it's very difficult to predict what was going to happen. You're looking at prior years was pretty much useless. So, um, uh, so we have had to make some estimates. We've, we've found we found South Australians are more than willing to buy packages, uh, accommodation package to ferries or um, Murray Princess. Um, um, we've got a theme cruise going next week, which is a hot August night sort of uh, Neil Diamond tribute uh, show, which has been quite popular. Once again, all oh. South Australia. Um, but certainly, yeah, I think uh, our winter campaign, particularly on the island, was around uh, value adding. Um, we did discount vouchers on the island, so when people were booked packages, they were able to get discount vouchers at attractions or coffee shops. So we, once again, more of that collaborative opportunity to try and get people onto the island or out, out of their houses in Adelaide and obviously trying to increase their spend when they're actually uh, travelling around. So um, we've been probably pleasantly surprised how much um, goodwill there is still towards the island, particularly the island. Um, but I think there's goodwill around all tourism operators and the regions to get out and actually support regional tourism, which of course is what we need people to do out of Adelaide. Yeah, absolutely. And so in talking about your sort of marketing campaigns and these packages and, and value adds, how are you sort of going out to market with that? I know you have the brilliant travel sort of branding. Is that under under that or you're doing some standalone um, under, you know, individual um, product brand as well? So certainly in South Australia, we've been going out pretty much with our own product brands. So uh, whether it be KI or Murray Princess or Cruises um, or Coach Touring, um, we've been going out because I think South Australians, you know, are very aware of their own state, interstate. Um, yeah, Sea Link is developing a, a brand called Brilliant Travels, which is a. Um, I'll show you a website picture in a second. But essentially, um, what we're trying to do is to a whole range of different, um, whole range of different. Uh, I'm just going to share the screen now. Hopefully that's working. Can everyone see that screen? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Okay, we'll just find a page down the next one. Um, yeah, the Brilliant Travels is more a national campaign that um, we're looking at developing. Uh, sorry, let's go to a couple of these. This is Brilliant Travels here. Yeah. So um, as Sealink is growing, we've got a whole range of destinations around Australia that we're trying to develop under a brand called Brilliant Travels. So. C-Link invested quite a considerable bit of money in a national marketing campaign, building this, the awareness of our, some of our key destinations around Australia. Kangaroo Island was obviously included in that as well. That's been a two-stage campaign. We've put the second stage on hold until the travel restrictions ease in Western, uh, Eastern states. Yeah. But certainly it's about bringing travels for us is around trying to, uh, in a national retail market, go out and actually build the awareness of what um, Sealink operate and build the destinations within our um, um, areas that we operate in. So if anyone has an opportunity to go onto the Brilliant Travels website, obviously Kangaroo Island was featured in that, was quite a considerable uh, investment by the company around the eastern, eastern states particularly, yeah. uh, building up our national database. And then of course the next stage will be putting in actual travel offers to actually get people to to come to KI or, or go to the other destinations that are listed. Absolutely. And is there sort of opportunities for, do you look to seek other um, product outside of that C-Link brand to partner with if, if other operators wanted to hook into to hook into some sort of collaborative marketing opportunities or does this sort of brilliant travel sit as a sort of a unique um, standalone sort of C-Link encompassing those brand, the brand well, we products? Do. Under yeah, we do, um, just going back to this other screen, we obviously um, look for partners all the time. And even with our Murray Princess, I noticed there's a couple of operators, Big Ben's on, I think on the webinar today. Um, so Murray Princess is a really important part of operating up and down the Murray. And of course, um, 
that activates a whole range of businesses up and down the Murray partners that we go to, whether it be North North Indigenous um, experience we provide. We go to Big Bend by night. Um, yeah. And we're up, as I say, we're up Bend's high up the river as Morgan this week, going up to um, a couple of wineries up there as well. So, yes, we're always looking for opportunities. I think also what I've said to our product people is that um, the domestic market gives us new opportunities to trial new products. Uh, so whether it be, you know, I think coach touring is going to be a challenge for us for a little while because domestic market, particularly in South Australians, don't so much get on coaches. They go self-drive. Once we can start seeing some domestic people coming in from interstate, there's an opportunities to start trialling some new coach touring options. And uh, we're looking at doing a, um, you know, a couple of new tours in um, in the springtime and summertime around uh, around Adelaide. That we haven't done it. New tours for a little while, but I think the new domestic market gives us opportunities for trial, trials and new tours. Imagine Cruising, which is this one that's on the screen at the moment, is probably a good example where Imagine Cruising essentially have always sold overseas cruise cruise um, options, you know, whether it be Norway, America. Okay, yes. Um, so now um, they've partnered with us to start developing new um, charter operations or at least um, cruise options particularly starting in 2021. Yeah. But they've, um, you know, so there's the, the retail or the travel agency trade, we're also looking for a product that um, is more domestic focused. So. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, it's just about looking for those new opportunities. But, you know, um, I, I like your comments about it. It's a time just to do a bit of trial and errors, test the waters with um, how our the appetite for the domestic in our domestic market is going to change, particularly as those border restrictions lift. Um, so it's a great opportunity to to try the market, test the market with some with some new innovative ideas, and reach for the stars essentially. Yeah, and that's hard, you know, because there's everyone's got to pay the bills, and then we need the cash coming in the door. So, um, but yeah, I think you know there's opportunities to trial a couple of new things if you've um, always had a bit of a, a an idea of something that may, may approach the domestic market better than the international market, then try and leverage yeah. the opportunity. I mean, I think also in that imagine cruising thing, it's, it's interesting they've got the word um, confidence bolded because I, I think, you know, once again, with this in travel, once it's even permitted, um, building people's confidence to actually being confident to travel, confident to pay, prepay, confident to actually. Um, be safe is a really important word that we look as an industry we've got to try and focus on to build yeah, that. I'm, I'm really interested what you say Peter about it's not obviously just the confidence to um about health and safety and and that's that's going to be we're going to have a new found of expectations for customers around that but it's the confidence for that whole um booking transition transaction I suppose um you're talking about the book to make the booking, the prepayment, um, because you know there's there's been some hurt experienced on the consumer side of things, um, with you know travels being cancelled and and postponed. And so, how are you, how are you finding the customers' expectations around this? And and how are you guys planning to um, continue to talk to the customer, not only around um, health and hygiene, but really building that. Um, consumer confidence to make the booking? Yeah, look, certainly we've pushed, well, I think like most businesses, we've looked for opportunities, whether it be, you know, accreditations, there's a whole range of different, I think I was going to get overwhelmed with how many different accreditations are floating around out there about COVID. I mean, the TIXA one um, is a good one because it's industry-based and, you know, so putting those COVID plans in place based around an industry model is, is very good. Um, we've done retraining of all our Murray Princess crew as an example. Obviously, you know, we, we our cruise boat, we're probably the only cruise vessel operating in, in Australia that I know of at the moment. Um, you know, we're not a big white cruise ship. We're a small brown one, which is probably good. Um, so, you know, we, either way, we, we have to do a fair bit of work to make sure people are reassured that coming onto Murray Princess is going to be safe. So we've developed um, some a cruise well guide, which provides information about the extra steps we've done on the on the Murray Princess, both staff training and the extra cleaning we're doing, but also how the customer can help themselves to uh, stay safe as well. So we've put those in place. Um, the coach touring is the same. We've obviously put sanitizer stations on all our coaches. 
the uh, industry guidance note initially SA Health capped coach touring at 20 people per coach. That's now changed to being um, unlimited or, you know, it's, uh, coaches are back to full capacity. But once again, we've, we've, we've published um, seating plans. So when people do come on board, we ask them to sort of follow the seating plans where possible. Kangaroo Island, um, we've had, we were under a fair bit of pressure recently, well, through the start of the COVID about uh, travel restrictions onto the island. So we've always try and reinforce that um, the border controls are at the SA border, they're not at Cape Jervis. Because um, yeah. I, I just, we don't want to put our staff in a position where they're, they're the ones determining who can come and who can't come to the island. Um, but essentially, the KI ferry operations is, is considered an essential service. And of course, a bit like public transport uh, has some special rules around um, maintaining those essential services. And then, uh, yeah, look, we've obviously used the SATC um, COVID awareness training, which is an online process that all our staff have been asked to complete um, to a point where Murray Princess Cruise crew uh, wouldn't can't start back on the boat until they've actually done all those all our COVID planning. So once again, just trying to, I, mean, I think all of us are trying to keep up with the changes. You know, liquor licensing is a real challenge at the moment. You're changing the rules around liquor licensing, whether you can stand having a drink or sit and having a drink, and whether you can dance and have a drink. You know, we're, as I said, we're running our hot August night cruise next week. Um, so some of the rules have changed recently about um, you can't have alcohol if you want to dance, and if you want to dance, you you know, anyway. So it, just, it just seems to be changing all the time. So we may not have dancing on the Murray Princess. There might be a lot of wiggling in seats. <laughs> I like it. And it's just being nimble and innovative to try and um, make, you know, you've got, you know, a, I love your concept with Hot August Night um, and Neil Diamond and you've got, you know, that's going to get an appetite with the market as well. So it's just trying to go, all right, how can we make the best of this situation despite those goalposts potentially changing as well? Yeah, for sure. And obviously, even with that coach touring, like we're obviously chasing, we're seeing a bit of movement in charters as well. So some of the, particularly South Australians, I think some of the groups that go out on charters are starting to think about doing some charter trips. Yeah. So if you're in that charter business, you know, there's an opportunity to try and uh, grab some of those dom domestic groups as they start going out to the regions. But certainly the groups, instead of going into state or even overseas, um, they're looking for opportunities, particularly in South Australia. Yeah, within within our own um, backyard and um, I think because we've been positioned so well through this. So despite obviously the challenges we've had, a, we've, we've got ahead, Peter, and what what's your outlook for the business, for the industry? Obviously knowing it's going to be a, a long, hard road. I'm interested in, in your thoughts and aspirations given you're such a veteran in our industry. Um, yes, well, I guess ultimately none of us have lived through this before, so I think it's okay to, for all of us to understand that we don't really, it, you don't need, it's hard to predict the future. So, but ultimately the trends for South Australians are that they're travelling, so that's good. Um, the state itself is still in a good position whilst there is the odd flare up from time to time. Um, we're well positioned to build on, build on that brand of being a safe, clean destination. Um, we, you know, the island, particularly I'm talking about the island now, there's, there's a lot of bushfire recovery still going on on the island. So there's some challenges around um, uh, just recovering from the initial fire issues on the island and making sure that whether it be accommodation stock gets replaced. Um, that's a challenge on the island. But ultimately, um, you know, as I said, there's a willingness for people to support Kangaroo Island. Um, but I think ultimately... You know, an opportunity, Peter, to see the island like you've never seen it before as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's where our bushfire recovery um, tour comes in. But, yeah, certainly the, the numbers that the um, Department of Environment are getting across, across all their properties, not just on the island, but uh, everywhere I go, um, I'm hearing that people are out in the national parks, people are out walking, people are out engaging in our national parks, which is fantastic. So if you've got those parks near you, you should try and make sure that you really leverage that outdoor experience that people really crave at the moment is getting out the fresh air and, and looking up. Yeah. Yeah, we're certainly getting that movement through the state from our South Australians. Um, and, uh, you know, 
I think it's just about trying to leverage leverage that to your advantage and, and try and get a bit of visibility as, as people are moving through the state. As we look to wrap up today's session, does anybody have some questions they might? I've enjoyed having a good old chat to Peter and, and you guys listen on. Um, has anybody got some questions they'd like to pop on the on the chat for Peter or um, yeah? You're more, more than welcome to. We can give a couple of minutes, or um, if not, we can we can look to look to wind this session up. I guess also what we've done, we've just launched our kids travel free after October. So October to December, we're running a campaign around families. I think the family market's a really important um, market because uh, you know those opportunities to try and get families travelling. I mean, that families are always been an important market, but I think domestically um, there's going to be more of this sort of family road trips, family um, outings that are going to be part of our industry for some time to come. So I guess we're trying to leverage that and offer the um, uh, kids travel free to the to the island. Yeah, absolutely. I think the good old fashioned family road trip um, is going to be coming back in fashion, and that I mean I I'm the family market myself. Uh, mum and dad with two young boys and um, I know my kids are scratching to be able to get back out there and um, and experience you know and have a holiday and have some great experiences in our in our own backyard as well um, I'll just question Sam has written up Sam did you want to feel free to take yourself off mute and and have a quick chat to Peter if you'd like Oh, we haven't got your volume there. He's on the road, road travelling already. <laughs> Is that better? Sorry? Yes, thanks, Sam. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sam, and thank you, Peter, for this lovely chat. Um, my question was, what can local organisations do to support with local tourism and the local businesses? Sure. Um, well, I think... And once again, this is unprecedented times. So we do need to be active in the market. Um, and, you know, the, the ability of small business to do their own marketing in, uh, away from their business is limited. So I am a former regional tourism manager. So I think in many ways, I think getting support through the regional tourism organisations is a really important way of projecting the voices of regional tourism. Um, you know, cert certainly uh, the... Um, there's, there's a whole range of different programs that the government's put out, whether it be, uh, you know, the, obviously, JobKeeper is one. Um, but obviously, the state government's also put out a, a lot of other um, offers as well. But I think building up the regional tourism organisations to be able to then um, have the resources to talk to the operators and then combine to, to, to do cooperative marketing more and more, I think, that's where I think the government can step in. I think obviously SATC do quite a big push on the brand of South Australia, which is great, but then the regions really need to sort of emphasise their key selling points. And that's done through the regional regional organisations. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, Peter, I, I've loved your positivity and I know where, you know, it's some people feel like they're up to it. Um, at the moment and, and it is definitely a long tough road ahead but it's just really important to um, keep positive and and support each other but also like Peter touched on exhaust every opportunity you can um, into trying to move forward and if that's thinking outside the spot box innovating in in new ideas and and connecting with your counterparts in in your regions it's it's really important um, to drive that as as much as possible um, if we don't have any more further questions peter thank you you've been so generous with your time today oh sorry one more question that's popped up um, Yvonne, again, you're most welcome to take yourself off mute, Yvonne, and, and have a quick chat to Peter, if you'd like. Alternatively, I can always read the message out. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's specific to um, accommodation on Kangaroo Island. Um, obviously, with um, marketing directed at, at locals, 
Um, I'm just wondering how local accommodation providers that are not associated with C-Link, how can we tap into C-Link marketing and get some sort of um, something sort of going with, uh, you know, C-Link? We've sort of tried, we've tried that personally with our accommodation a few times by email and also by phone, but we haven't had any return correspondence. So we're just wondering, you know, about missed opportunities there for, you know, very small, you know, um, small operators who have struggled through the bushfires and now through COVID. Yeah, thanks, Ron. I'm happy to, what property you operate, Ron? I'm sorry. Um, it's called Sunrise on Faley. It's just three, three self-contained apartments and okay. we're um, situated in American River. Okay, sure. That's right. I can get someone to give you a call. I'm not too sure why you haven't had a return call, but I'll, I'm going to chase that through. But look, certainly, you. Um, you know, obviously, even just from a point of view, having on, particularly you being on the island, people need to get to the island. So um, you can certainly leverage off your own website to sort of make sure there's links to our, to our able to book the ceiling product. Um, we do have an accommodation partners program, which obviously then gets you listed in our sales centre. There's commission structures in place for those as well. So that does restrict some smaller operators, um, mainly also because of availabilities. But like, once again, I can get someone to give you a call about that. But certainly, um, yeah, look, uh, once again, through your regional organisations, try to make sure you have a strong presence there. Um, the more you can link to our, because basically I, I, I would think if you want to get people onto your website, you want to make that a one-stop shop to book your accommodation as well as then booking the, the ferry as well. So make sure there's strong links towards our, our website. Also, obviously people can book online uh, and um, if there are specials that we're running, particularly as I say with our um, family free in October, make sure that's on your website to motivate people to make a booking, um, even if it's direct to you and then direct to, to our website. So. So that's what I think we're just going to keep an eye out for our deals and offers that we have coming through the island and then making sure that on your own website, even your own social media, that you're pushing uh, to motivate people to come across and take advantage of any special that are running. Thank you. Oh, and I'll get something yeah, to do for Good tips there, Peter, particularly about being that one-stop shop and, and that source of information. Sure, I think we're dropping out a bit. Um, ...to people to... Okay, we feel, I'm starting to feel like we're just having a few technical glitches here. So I might take this opportunity to wrap it up. If anybody has any further questions for um, Peter or... Feel free to click them through to myself and I can then it's an insight sharing us your journey um, through this challenge um, particularly thrown to you in a new role as and leading this leading the organization through this so um, thank you once again um, good luck as you continue to move through this um, and I think it's just about this guys connecting Keeping in touch, connecting, sharing knowledge and ideas is really important for our whole industry to be able to move forward. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope... I hope you've enjoyed listening to Peter as I have much enjoyed having a, a chat to him as well. And we'll continue to um, bring you more of these sessions into the future. Thank you.